Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a historic vote about San Diego's water supply. At stake, the county's long-term commitment to buy millions of gallons of desalinated water. And wrecking crews move into Horton Plaza for the start of a $14 million redevelopment project. Plus, an alarming number of immigrant workers are abused on this side of the border. We'll take an in-depth look at revealing new research. I'm Peggy Pico. Dwayne Brown is off tonight. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Late this afternoon, a historic vote changed the future of San Diego's water supply. The county's 24 water agencies voted to approve a 30-year contract to buy desalinated water from the private company Poseidon Resources. KPBS reporter Allison St. John just returned from the meeting. And Allison, tell us why this vote is so important. Well, Peggy, San Diego currently depends on imported water, and that makes it very vulnerable to being cut off in a drought situation in the future. So this agreement will give San Diego an independent source of water using ocean water that's been desalinated by the biggest desalination plant ever built in the United States, right here in Carlsbad. The plant will be built by Poseidon Resources for almost a billion dollars, and the contract agreed to today commits San Diego to pay for almost 50 million gallons of desalinated water a day for 30 years once the plant is built, which could be by 2016 because the company already has all the permits. That'll be about 7 to 10 percent of all the water that San Diego will need, and as one board member said, you can't recycle water if you don't have it, and this will create new water. That's a huge commitment. What does this really mean for ratepayers? Well, the cost to ratepayers is still not known. The cost of service agreement is not yet hashed out. And some estimates are 5 to $7 to the average water bill being added, and other people say it'll add 10 to $20, and even more for big water users. So opponents of the project expressed some concerns about this, and they pointed out that desalination takes a lot of energy, and energy costs could skyrocket. That could throw all the calculations out of whack. They said it would be better to sign on to water recycling first because it's cheaper. And they pointed to desal plants in Australia, for example, that have had to be shut down because of the costs have spiraled out of control. But supporters, like Mayor Sanders and the Chamber of Commerce, said the contract has been written to protect ratepayers. And the water agencies agreed to start a collaborative process to decide how to share the costs. As one member put it, now the real fight begins. All right, KPBS reporter Allison St. John, thanks for the update. Tomorrow, the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court will consider if it will review a legal challenge to Proposition 8, California's ban on same-sex marriage. Supporters of the ban on same-sex marriage are appealing a lower court ruling which declared it unconstitutional. If the high court agrees to take on the case, oral arguments could be heard as early as next spring with a decision expected by next summer. But if the justices reject the appeal, the last ruling will stand, meaning California's ban on same-sex marriage will not be legal. The court's decision on whether to hear the case is expected on Monday. A second man has been resentenced under California's newly reformed three strikes law. Both cases were heard here in San Diego, but there's a twist in this newest reform case. KPBS Fronteras reporter Aaron Siegel is in the newsroom with more. And Aaron, last week, Kenneth Corley was resentenced and released with credit for time served, but it's not quite so simple for Sergio Ayala, right? No, it's not quite so simple. So when Sergio Ayala was convicted back in 1995, he wasn't a U.S. citizen. He only had legal residency. So this means now he's going to be deported after he's released from prison. Is there a plan to help him stay in Tijuana and out of trouble once he's deported? Certainly, Peggy, there is. So his lawyers told me this morning that there is an extensive plan in place for Ayala. Once he gets to Tijuana, um, he has a job in place working as a mechanic. He also has a bed reserved for him for six months at a rehab facility where he could be offered benefits like group therapy and other things. All right, Fronteras Report and Aaron Siegel, thanks so much. 
San Diego State University conducted the first scientific study of labor trafficking in the U.S. The report includes interviews with local migrant workers. Their stories reveal an alarming amount of danger, injustice, and abuse. Earlier today, I spoke with one of the study's researchers, Estela De Los Rios, executive director of the Center for Social Advocacy. Estela, welcome. Now tell me, who did the researchers talk with and how did you help them get that information? Due to our relationship in the community addressing human trafficking for eight years, we had conversations with migrant workers in different areas of the San Diego region, North County, South County, East County, in rural areas and in remote areas. Therefore, Dr. Zhang um, connected with us to outreach to these communities and get a random sampling of all the regions. And you talked to about 826 unauthorized workers, uh, Spanish speaking. Correct. You also offered them um, some uh, compensation for this. Tell us yes. why. Yes, we had some incentives for them because honest, quite honestly, they are losing a day's work in a whole day. So we had a focus group and we asked them what would be fair, what appropriate, and they came up with $30 a day. And then they had the reference, if they referred someone, it would be $10 extra. So they had the opportunity to have $60 for that day. We're going to come back to the questions, right. but first the study identified where uh, these workers uh, were employed. And 20% worked in food processing, another 17% in construction, 17% in janitorial services, 10% in agriculture, and 6% in manufacturing. I think people would be surprised that these sort of abuses or uh, things that happened to these immigrant workers didn't happen out in the fields. 20% we're in food processing. Did that surprise you? Absolutely, that's correct. Um, these percentages reflect this study, and this is why it's the hidden population, because you would not suspect that in restaurants or in food processing there would be some labor trafficking. Kind of in plain sight. Uh, the study revealed nearly a third of the immigrant workers, uh, mm -hmm. 38,000, I believe you said, a little more exactly. than that, experience labor trafficking. Tell us what labor trafficking is. And that's a very good question because many times the challenge is these are just labor abuses or practices. They're not labor trafficking. There's a fine line. When it becomes coercion, when it becomes threats and fear to leave your work or to threaten your family's life or to do, have some sexual abuse, then it becomes trafficking. And there were actually reports of sexual trafficking as well, uh, rapes, assaults, things like that. Yes, there was a lot of crimes reported. For an instance, one that resonates in my mind continuously is a mother that saw her daughter being raped and she was 12 years old and the 12 year old observed her mother being raped. And these are horrific crimes. We're speaking rapes, kidnappings, and this is not labor practices. This is labor trafficking. Labor or sexual trafficking, exactly. either one. Do these exactly. immigrant workers report this to authorities? That's the challenge. We have tried to work with authorities, and authorities have been very um, positive in our in our collaboration. But the the challenge is this: they de they fear deportation. They fear that they're going to be the ones that are going to be the incarcerated. And we continuously let them know they have rights. They have an opportunity for a T visa, U visa. They have opportunities to speak up. But again, the fear factor uh, remains. Being deported or, or, or worse. Exactly. Um, what were some of the other labor and safety issues, maybe not as large as that, mm -hmm. but just as important? For example, in construction, they wouldn't uh, give them the hard hats. Um, a lot of them worked with chemicals and they would get burned. They would have um, a lot of health issues afterwards with um, breathing, um, pesticides. Um, and one would say, well, just report them to OSHA, but it, it's huge more than OSHA because then you go back and the employer disappears. Right, and, and also I understand there was some no payment, improper equipment, as you said. Exactly. Um, some people would argue that migrant workers put themselves in this situation, a vulnerable situation, uh, they're here illegally, so what is your response to that criticism? In, in regards to the status, whether they're here undocumented or documented, these are crimes. These are serious crimes that we're speaking about. And I believe that crimes should be prosecuted. What did you do when you heard about some of these horrific crimes like the mother-daughter rape? Uh, how did you guys help uh, the people that uh, once you found out about these? We followed up and we, our temp was to try to assist this woman 
to report this first and foremost. And because of the traumatic experience, she just wanted to let it go and just move forward. And these are the experiences that we have on a continuous basis. But you did reach out to many of these Yes, workers. we always reach okay. out to them. And again, we give them the opportunities to assist them with resources. Okay. Uh, Estela De Los Rios, thank mm -hmm. you so much for talking with us. Now, you can read the entire SDSU report called Looking for a Hidden Population Trafficking of Migrant Laborers in San Diego County on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you. Researchers at San Diego State have also launched a new study on autism. Scientists will look at the difference between brain networks of children and teens with autism compared to those who aren't autistic. Researchers hope their work will help with early detection, diagnosis, and treatment of children with autism. Meanwhile, another team in San Diego uh, plans, another team of researchers plan to send fruit flies into space. That's right. The flies will help scientists study the impact of space travel on the human heart. The team from Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute says fruit flies are perfect for this study because the genetic and molecular makeup of the little winged critters' hearts are quite similar to our own human hearts. I'm Margaret Warner. On the next news hour, melting polar ice sheets in Greenland, plus Senator elect Jeff Flake of Arizona. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. If you usually go to the downtown county building to pay your property taxes, you may want to change your routine this December. Major construction is underway in the area, and the county tax collector is urging people to pay some other way, online, by phone, at a branch office, or by mail. No matter how you do it, though, property tax payments are due on December 10th. Demolition is underway at Horton Plaza. The old Robinson's May building is being torn down to make way for a new public park. The $14 million project is one of the final projects created by San Diego's now defunct redevelopment agency. And it's part of a vision for downtown dating back to former mayor Pete Wilson. We thought that with a little public assistance, we could spur a tremendous amount of confidence and therefore private investment and private renewal, gas lamp did not exist. But I would have to say what's happened has exceeded my fondest expectations. Westfield owns the Horton Plaza Shopping Center and sold the Robinson's May store back to the city for the new one acre public square. We caught up with City Council Member Kevin Faulkner just after the demolition began for a closer look at the redevelopment project that's right inside his district. Mr. Faulkner, thank you so much for joining us. Expansion of the oh, Horton Plaza Park is actually a city project, and it's supposed to add public space in front of the Horton Plaza Shopping Center. Um, remind us of what that looks like now and how that's going to change. Yeah, well, th thank you for having me. It was a very <laughs> exciting day downtown, um, and we're embarking on a remarkable transformation. We are going to tear down that old building right in the front that used to be the Planet Hollywood uh, building, and we're creating a world-class public park open space, one and a half acres, uh, that will be a special place for generations to come. Well, let's take a look at the architect's plans. Um, the first one is sort of an overview here. Mm -hmm. Tell us what we're looking at here. Well, you can see right there that's the that's the photo of, of the new park you see towards the uh, the right hand portion of the picture the the current uh, uh, park but we are that building goes away we create as I said before an acre and a half of public open space you see the new trees the amphitheater there um, the seating restrooms uh, it's food pavilions it's let's, gonna be great let's talk about that amphitheater what's that gonna be used yeah. for we, free concerts Absolutely. movies the, what? Whole, the whole idea of the space is to, is to activate it to make sure that you're we're attracting people you know during the day and during the night and so we have about 200 days a year that we're planning on programs from anything from dances to concerts to movies on the back of the wall there. So the idea is let's bring people there, let's, activate it. I want 
I want to get a shot of that movie, uh, the rendition, the artist rendition. Can we uh, show oh, yeah. everybody? Yeah, yeah, look great, at that giant screen. The, the, the great shot with the uh, with the night shot, if you will, with everybody sitting around the uh, amphitheater and the, the the building that's there now. You can see that's designed to be a digital uh, background there, so for movies and special presentations and others. And and I think you know, to, when, as you look at the possibilities there, you know, several hundred people out there on a warm San Diego night. Uh, that's the kind. That's the type of gathering that we're talking about. World class open public space uh, and that's the opportunity. Let's talk about during the day. So we saw the movies there at night but there was a, a, an artist rendition we'll put up here for everybody to see where there's actually tents in the mm -hmm. center uh, of this. What are those for? Yeah this, this is a good illustration that shows what might be possible on a Saturday or Sunday as we have vendors in for a farmer's market or other types of things um, that we can attract people you know temporary tents uh, to come in and enjoy do some shopping be outdoors, be out in the sunshine. Uh, and so this, this rendering right here, I think, is what we, you'll probably see a lot during the day on a Saturday or Sunday. There's something else about this, this open space you touched on on the beginning. Let's take a look at this last uh, artist picture here, rendering of it. You can see, you were telling me you can see through now yeah. uh, the area all the way back to, uh, tell, tell us what we're looking well, at and what is, we can see. I, this is one of my favorite uh, renderings of the whole project because you look, you're, it, almost if you're on Broadway looking back, the building is gone and we've created a, a remarkable vista in view to the historic Balboa Theater, which is you're seeing at the, the background of the shot. Looking through the columns, they're going to be there. You saw them lit up at night. Um, this is going to be a whole new front porch for downtown San Diego. And as you can see by the, the amphitheater shot there and all of the trees, uh, it's, it's going to be a place, a gathering place for, for families, for other folks. And we, we were out there talking today at the groundbreaking. A lot of people said this would be a great place to have New Year's Eve celebrations. So you can start to think of all of the great civic the gathering places that we'll have. The excitement of it. Now, the city acquired this store property. I think it was Robinson May and then Hollywood Planet or something. I can't quite remember. Planet Hollywood. It's Planet yeah, Hollywood. Right. Um, but they did it in a really creative way. So what, what was that arrangement? It, great private-public partnership with the Westfield Corporation, which owns Horton Plaza now. And uh, they were looking to make some changes there. The city we've been in interested in providing more open space and public parks downtown. So this whole project came together with financing from help from Westfield Corporation, from the redevelopment agency, now Civic San Diego. A great partnership with the idea mean, being how can we get this done? How can we get it completed? Um, it took about two years, actually. And so today was, was a pretty big milestone. Um, will this generate any uh, funds for uh, the city? It won't generate uh, much funds. I mean, we'll have some sales tax from some of the, the vendors that are going to be down there. But this is this is about providing an amenity. This is about pr providing a gathering space. You know, when you look at other cities, whether it's across the country or across the world, one of the hallmarks of a great urban space is to have a great urban city is to have these public open spaces, gathering spaces. We don't quite have that in downtown San Diego, uh, but we're going to now. The people will get that. What will Westfield get out of it? Well, they were looking for a way. They they want to make Horton Plaza more inviting, more attractive. As you remember when Horton Plaza was developed back in the mid '80s, downtown was a vastly different place. It wasn't the safest place to be. The shopping center was designed, you know, inward, not outward. So they're going to be looking to make some major changes coming forward in the future to help open that up. And this is a big part of doing that to make it more inviting for people to come down and enjoy it. Before we go, how much is it expected to cost and when will it be open to the public? $14 million uh, construction uh, going to be starting and we told folks today look forward to doing this in spring of 2014. All right, City Council Member Kevin Faulkner, thanks so yeah, much. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. Now you can take a closer look at the plans for Horton Plaza Park on our website, kpbs.org. No Chargers will be seen on local TV this weekend for the third time this season. The team did not sell enough tickets to avoid an NFL-mandated TV blackout. There are still 11,000 tickets available for Sunday's game against the Cincinnati Bengals. Right now, the Chargers' record is four wins and seven losses, and the Bengals are favored to win this weekend. Twinkies may be back in lunch boxes soon. Hostess, the company that makes the sweet treats, say they've got more than 100 potential buyers for its product lines as it liquidates. Meanwhile, the company is seeking court approval of nearly two million dollars in bonuses for its top executives as it shuts down. Hostess declared bankruptcy for the second time after its bakers union went on strike earlier this month. The union wants an independent trustee to oversee the company's liquidation. And tomorrow marks the end of the line for a historic oyster farm on the coast of Northern California. The Drake's Bay Oyster Company has been in business on the Point Reyes National Seashore 
for 100 years. It has 30 employees, but today, the U.S. Department of the Interior said it would not renew the company's lease. Environmentalists uh, say that the oyster farm threatened wildlife. The land will be returned to Mother Nature as a wilderness site. A high surf advisory is in effect in the, uh, for Southern California through Monday afternoon. Storms in the Pacific are causing the heavy surf. Waves reached about seven feet in Ocean Beach earlier today, and they're expected to get even higher this weekend with predictions of up to 14 feet, according to Surfline.com. Along with the high surf, the National Weather Service says we can also expect a chance of showers over the next few days. Here's a look at the forecast. Earlier in this newscast, we talked about the future of San Diego's water supply with the approval of a contract to buy millions of gallons of desalinated water. That's the future. But Ken Kramer takes us back to San Diego's water past. Here it is, just a few parts of it remaining, about all there is left to see, in fact, of what was once this. One of the most amazing structures ever built in San Diego, made of 9 million board feet of redwood, it was a 33-mile-long open tray of flowing water. I think you had to see it to believe it, but at least there are pictures. See, it used to be in San Diego that most of the water we drank and used for irrigation came from wells, and it was salty, sometimes nauseating, not good water, really. But in 1889, this flume changed everything, and it was just an enormous project to bring good mountain water from the mountains to the eastern part of La Mesa and on to San Diego. First of all, there had to be a dam built way up on the San Diego River at Boulder Creek. That's where the water was captured to be put in the flume. And the flume itself, just imagine what it was like, six feet wide, 18 inches deep, full of water running all those miles, and it had to be all downhill, of course, so the water would keep flowing. There were tunnels. Here's the Los Coches Tunnel being built. And more than 300 trestles, including this one, the Los Coches Trestle, 1,774 feet long, 65 feet high. Nobody had ever seen anything like that in San Diego. So amazing was this thing that on opening day, 22nd of February, 1889, Public officials and dignitaries took a ride in wooden boats down a good part of the flume. Sitting right there in the front, that's the governor of California, whose name, interestingly, was Robert W. Waterman. So the flume was built, but then it had to be maintained. It was wood, after all, and sometimes it leaked. So you had flume walkers who saw trouble spots and made repairs, inspectors continuously patrolling for problems, and houses were built along the route so those workers and their families had a place to live. Looking back, there were lots of issues with the San Diego flume. For one thing, in the hot summer months, all that water in a fairly shallow container moving along, too much of that water evaporated. In 1919, a windstorm blew over the Sweetwater trestle that had been weakened by leaks and deterioration of the wood. But in its time and for its purpose, it did its job, the water eventually ending up in La Mesa Reservoir, piped from there into San Diego, La Mesa Reservoir, which would later be built up into what would become Lake Murray. And some of the water, too, went to a rancher's pond, sometimes known as Duck Pond. If you've ever been to Anthony's Fish Grotto, you know the Duck Pond is still there, even though the flume is gone. No, it just didn't age well. By the late 1920s, customers were demanding repairs, and the state-of-the-art in water delivery and storage had changed. In time, dams were built, the Lower Otai and Morena, and pipes, siphons, and concrete tunnels replaced the flume. But what a thing it was. Here's old Highway 80 and the flume, now the Lake Jennings Park Road off-ramp from Interstate 8, where just up the road at the R.M. Levy Water Treatment Plant, the Helix Water District has kept just a few bits of the flume that visitors can see. An old wagon that rolled down the flume during its construction. There's some of the redwood pipe that replaced it. And then a section, just a section, 
of what was once an engineering marvel that delivered good, sweet water from the mountains and became a remarkable part of history about San Diego. You can see more of Ken Kramer's stories about San Diego tonight at 8 p.m. right here on KPBS. Recapping tonight's top stories, the San Diego County Water Authority approved a 30-year deal to buy desalinated water from a plant to be built in Carlsbad. The Poseidon plant will be the largest of its kind in the Western Hemisphere. Officials say converting seawater will give us a more reliable supply. Opponents say the cost to ratepayers still isn't worked out. And demolition is underway at Horton Plaza. The old Robinson May building in downtown is being torn down to make way for a new $14 million public park. It's one of the final projects created by San Diego's now defunct redevelopment agency. And tomorrow, the U.S. Supreme Court will consider if it will review a legal challenge to Proposition 8, California's ban on same-sex marriage. Supporters of the ban are appealing a lower court ruling claiming it's unconstitutional. The court's decision on whether to hear the case is expected on Monday. If they say no, the last ruling will stand, taking Prop 8 off the books. You can find all of tonight's stories and more on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us and have a great night.